Good morning. Welcome to Thursday Bible Life Today. Get your Bibles and turn to the book of Titus. We will also be looking at 2 Timothy. Last week we finished a couple of weeks in looking at the book of 1 Timothy. And this morning we're going to begin looking at highlights from the book of Titus and follow that up with looking at highlights from the book of 2 Timothy. If we were following the chronological presentation that we find in the Reese Chronological Bible, uh, we would have gone from Titus to uh, 1 Peter and then to Hebrews and then finally to uh, either 2 Timothy or 2 Peter at that time. But we're going to look at Titus and then finish uh, Paul's writing to the uh, second book of Timothy. This Titus is another one of Paul's understudies. He was an apprentice of Paul, very much like uh, Timothy was, and Titus was with uh, Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. And in fact, he also went with them to the council in Jerusalem that we read about quite some time ago from the 15th chapter of the book of Acts and also from the second chapter of the book of Galatians. And we see that uh, Paul has left Titus in Crete. So I'll begin reading uh, verse number five of Titus chapter one. For this reason, I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. So in this first chapter, Paul gives requirements of the elders would be like the same requirements as we read about for the bishops or the overseers in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And he referenced the people of Crete in this first chapter in some verses that we're not taking the time to read. And he impressed upon Titus the importance of him teaching sound doctrine in addition to appointing elders in the cities. When we drop down to chapter 2 in the book of Titus, we might consider that the theme of this chapter is a pattern for Christian living or characteristic traits of a sound church. Paul spoke to nearly all the various categories that you could imagine of, of people, uh, and you'll see what I mean as I begin to read in verse number one and read down through verse number 10. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. The older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may admonish the young women to love their husbands and to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Exhort bondservants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things." So here are Paul's instructions for older men, older women, younger men, younger women, and even bond servants. And these are the characteristic traits, as I mentioned, that are found in a sound church, family, or body. So now we'll look at verse uh, 11 through about 14 of the second chapter of Titus and find a, a familiar verse in this passage and uh, see what it says about what we should be looking for. 
For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that we might be redeemed from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. So here these instructions can be taken as given directly to us in our day. This is another occasion when we're exhorted to be looking for the return of Christ at the rapture of the church, which he calls here our blessed hope. And until he comes, we are to be zealous for good works. We'll notice several times in this book of Titus, as well as in several other places in Paul's writings, that our maintaining good works is an important characteristic trait that we should have in the world as Christ followers. Now we'll drop down to chapter number three of Titus and the subheading in my study Bible above verse one says the graces of the heirs of grace. Verse one, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, and this next three verses are probably familiar verses and very important, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying. And these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. So verses 5 through 7, where it talks about not by works of righteousness we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. They're very important uh, for us to understand them and the relationship that they have to our salvation. It's not by works, but it's by, it's by his grace and mercy that we have been given salvation. And as I pointed out again, he referenced our being involved in good works. And in verse nine of chapter three and verse 10, he's going to warn uh, Titus, which we also can take as a warning to us, to avoid dissension. Verse 9 says, But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. It's similar to what I try to remind people about in our day and time, and that is that we will never argue anyone into heaven. We can have a, a humble and uh, polite debate or conversation or compare thoughts about scripture, but when we allow the conversation to get to an argument, if we happen to win the argument, we've lost the person. And so we never argue anyone into heaven. We can love them into heaven. We can pray for them into heaven, but we mustn't argue. And I think that's what Paul is trying to say here about avoiding dissension. Well, as I said, if we were to follow the 
chronological presentation that Reese gives in his Reese Chronological Bible. At this point, we'd look into 1 Peter, but instead we're going to go to 2 Timothy, what most scholars to believe uh, to be Paul's last writing before he was executed in the Roman prison after his second imprisonment there. So in 2 Timothy chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 3 through 7. Talks about Timothy's, Timothy's faith and his heritage. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day. Paul's very good to tell people that he prays for them. And he prayed for Titus, and he prayed for Timothy, and he prayed for, I believe, probably every church that he ever ministered to. But he says, I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's a good admonition for us in our day, especially in the day in which we live with such uh, uncertainty in the world and chaos and even war in various parts of the world. And we need to be reminded that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Very wonderful uh, reminders that we need to share with one another and to encourage one another with. We're going to drop down to chapter 2 now in 2 Timothy and look at the first seven verses. And here we're going to see a famous verse that is probably the backbone or the theme of the Navigators organization, if you're familiar with them. It would also be uh, the, the basis of our discipling ministry in our day and time. In verse 1 of 2 Timothy chapter 2, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And verse 2 is this verse that I was referring to. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That particular verse is the backbone of the Navigators organization, and it's the basis by which we should all be involved in discipling someone. Verse 3 says, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be the first one to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. So in verse 2 of this portion of the book of 2 Timothy, the theme verse for the navigators uh, should be our marching orders and discipling others in our lifetime. We're reminded that we're in a spiritual battle, and this spiritual battle may enter into our physical situation in life as well, and so we are to be prepared for that and to be faithful. I'm going to read now verses 14 and 15 of 2 Timothy chapter 2. It's a subheading here that says approved and disapproved workers. And these uh, verses are very important to me and I think should be to all of us. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit to the ruin of the hearers but be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So for us to be a workman 
that needs not to be ashamed, studying to show ourselves approved, rightly dividing the word of truth, means that we need to be in God's word on a daily basis. It's my opinion that verse 15 is one of the two most important verses in the whole book of 2 Timothy. We'll come to the next one and maybe the most important one when we get to the end of chapter 3. But it's rightly dividing the word of truth. And to me, that, dis that supports a dispensational view and study of the scriptures. And remember that one of the outstanding characteristic traits of a dispensationalist is that we recognize the difference between the nation of Israel and the Jewish people versus the New Testament church. And I believe that God has a plan and a purpose for both of them, and both of them will be an entity throughout all of eternity, which means I believe that God is by no way finished with the nation of Israel and he has a plan and a purpose for them and I believe that we can support that from scripture and doing so is accomplished by a dispensational view and uh, interpretation of scripture. Well now we're going to drop down to chapter number three of second Timothy and look at the first five verses. It talks about perilous times in the latter days and I think that you and I are right smack dab in the middle of those. Verse 1, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people, turn away. Where there was a whole list of things there that some of them sound really, really bad. And in the midst of those things, disobedient to parents is one that was included in the list which in our day and age probably would be questioned if it's in the right category, if it's put in there with uh, proud people and blasphemers and ungodly and unforgiving and slanderers and people who are out of self-control and things like that. But Paul included being disobedient to parents in that list. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And then he said, from such people, turn away. So I believe that the days in which Paul is describing here are the very days in which you and I are living. So now we come to the last of chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. What I believe to be the most important uh, verse or verses in all of 2 Timothy. And among those that might be of the most important in all of the New Testament. Verse 16 and 17 of 2 Timothy chapter 3. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And verse 17 says, so that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So these verses attest to God's word being inerrant, eternal, and unchanging. The only absolute truth on which we can base our life, both here and for all of eternity. Knowing what God's word has to say, interpreting it correctly, as we read from chapter 2, rightly dividing the word of truth. These are very imperative for us in our day, especially in our day. Because if you have a biblical worldview and you have trusted in Christ as your savior and make application of the scriptural principles that we read from scripture, 
you are in a very small minority in the world today. And in fact, it's almost like people who have a bullseye on their back. And so the perilous times that Paul was talking about in the last days, I think are the days in which you and I find ourselves living. And so just as what Paul had to say to Titus and to Timothy, to be strong and courageous, to maintain sound doctrine, uh, to compete as an athlete according to the rules, to be a faithful soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ, to rightly divide his word of truth, and to understand that his word is inspired by the Holy Spirit, the Bible is inspired, it is eternal, it is inerrant, and it's unchanging, just like God himself. So next week, we'll be looking at some additional verses in the New Testament, and we'll be looking probably at 1 Peter when we come back next week, if you'd like to read ahead. Father, thank you for today and for all the many blessings you've given. Thank you so much for those who join us online. I'm so grateful for them, and I ask that you bless them. Keep them in good health and in safety. Father, we pray for your children around the world who are in harm's way that you would bless and protect them and give them grace and strength for each day and encouragement in you. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We realize that there will be no peace, genuine peace, until the Lord comes back to set up his kingdom. And we pray that might be soon. But until then, help us to be faithful. Thank you for the promises of your word. Help us to make application in our lives with the scriptural principles that we read. In Jesus' name, we thank you and praise you. Amen. Hope to see you maybe Saturday afternoon in our study of the Holy Spirit. Until we do see you next time, Lord bless you.